Hey everybody, it's John again, and uh, so a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I'm doing this again. I, I did this vlog last Tuesday, and uh, people, enough people liked it. I, I think that it was, uh, it was a different format for me. Uh, it's something I don't usually do, but uh, for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, last week I reviewed Ready Player One this way because on Tuesdays I happen to have this rare window of time where I'm in between work and uh, just my weekly commitment on Tuesdays. So this week I found myself able to do that again and I have stuff that I would love to talk about. now. Quick thing, you if you saw me last week, you probably already noticed, I am in fact wearing the same shirt that I wore last Tuesday. I did not realize this until I literally was like about to do this. Um, and I even considered like putting on a jacket or something to hide it, but you know what? I'm just gonna let my favorite shirt fly here. Uh, this is it, this is what I look like uh, on most days. So uh, yeah, have fun with that, I guess. What are we talking about? Uh, what does it mean? when somebody says the characters are likable. What do we mean by that? Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because, well, first of all, I haven't seen any new movies this week, and uh, that's super rare for me. I haven't seen a movie since last Monday, uh, Ready Player One, which, if you, if, you don't know, if you don't know me, that might sound like, oh, I guess he doesn't watch a lot of movies. That, for me, is insane, because I usually watch like a dozen movies or so a week, and uh, the reason I haven't been watching anything is because I've been knee-deep in my newest book. Uh, it's coming out in September of this year, and this past week, my deadline for the book was Sunday. So I've been just, my whole life has been that book, basically, and uh, I finished it. I'm really excited. It's called Vanguard. Uh, one of these days, I'll release like more information on it or something. Um, the first book in that series is already out. It's like a thing, I guess, but... That said, that's not what we're talking about uh, today. Today, I really want to talk about a topic I raised on Twitter uh, because Twitter is where I live. Uh, it's where I spend a lot of my time, um, unfortunately. Um, you know, to me, Twitter is like an ecosystem, though, and I think it's a great place to connect with people and raise interesting topics, but even though it can be a cesspool of uh, just the worst things about, you know, society. So even though that is true, uh, I use Twitter a lot. And I, today I, I raised a question that I wanted to get a lot of clarity on. And I did, I think I got some, I, I, uh, I asked this question, um, and maybe you can relate with this. Uh, have you ever been talking to somebody about a film? Uh, this can be a film critic that you could be reading. Uh, it could be somebody you're talking to in real life. And they say something like, I didn't think the characters were likable. You know, this is something that I said a lot. This is something that I throw out there when I'm doing the Cinema Hawks podcast. I just sort of say, like, I didn't like this character. And usually, you know, I say why, I give my reasons, and a lot of people do this. But an issue that I am sort of seeing with uh, film criticism today is that when we say, the, I didn't like the characters, we say it so much, it's such a common thing that we assume everybody gets what we're talking about. And we assume that like, okay, well, what I mean by that criticism is what this other person means. And I think it can create confusion. And I think it can lead to just kind of boring criticism. It can kind of lead to uh, us not really upping our game a little bit. So I do, I just want to raise this, you know, it's not something that I have a super clear opinion on even, and something that I've been thinking about all day. It's been something that I sort of raised and had some people chime in on. And so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at uh, people's responses. Uh, and the first, the first, uh, my, my gut instinct when I ask myself that question, because again, I do this all the time. I, I give that very lazy, like I didn't like the character and I don't go further. Uh, when I do that, or when I read it from somebody else, I initially think, well, what you mean by likable is that you didn't root for the character. Uh, you watched this movie, you saw a character do the thing, and you didn't want them to succeed. Or you saw them do the thing and you just didn't, you know, you didn't care. You know, it's almost two different things, but you kind of get what I'm saying. It's like you're just not invested in the characters. It's another very common thing that we say. And sometimes we just don't elaborate and we don't uh, build upon as a way to persuade people of our opinion of a movie and what we think about it subjectively. So problems with that, if you approach a movie this way and you say, well, I didn't root for the character, well, that creates problems. And, and people brought this up on uh, the Twitter thread. Uh, and I really believe that it is true that when you say that, sometimes I watch a movie and I don't like the characters and that doesn't affect my enjoyment of the movie. It, kind of actually is a reason why I might like it uh, if I don't root for the character. Uh, somebody raised this, and I, and I need to look at people's names because I want to give them proper credit here. Um, but just just a person who brought this up 
Uh, this is David. David tweeted, uh, I use it, he was talking about the likable criticism, when talking about the fact that some films have characters that are hard to root for, it's not always a problem, but definitely an extra hurdle. So I, I liked what he's introducing there, uh, and, and David's kind of putting out there that, you know, if the, if the movie, if, if, if I don't root for the character, it can be a hurdle. But it doesn't necessarily mean that every character has to be rooted for. Um, I really liked what Jeremy had to say, um, and uh, I, I'll do their ads as well. So David was at PC Case Study. Um, I think that's like pop culture case study, not like, you know, personal computer. Anyway, uh, Jeremy, who is at Sauron's Bane, uh, Jeremy's great. Follow him on uh, Letterboxd. Uh, I'm always keeping up with uh, Jeremy's reviews. But Jeremy said, my take is that unlikable characters only become an issue when the movie itself seems unaware of that fact. And even then, that's more an issue of earning character moments than how likable they may or may not be. Uh, most recently, Glass Castle drove me up a wall in this respect. Glad Jeremy brought that up because, uh, yeah, it, it and somebody else actually mentioned this. If it's the director's intent for the character to be unlikable, that can actually work. Uh, it, you could have a scenario, and I, you know, I talked about Whiplash at one point with somebody about, uh, yeah, you know, Damien Chazelle, the director of that movie, wants you to dislike basically every character in that movie except for poor Melissa Benoist who is just this like you know doting carefree movie theater employee <laughs> um you know take the subtext for that uh, in as you will uh who just wants to have like a decent relationship with this guy and does not do so uh because the main character Miles Teller uh Newman or Neiman I think his name is Neiman in the movie uh Andrew Neiman he is a horrible person. He does things that I think is are despicable. He makes choices in the movie that I'm like, don't do that. What you're doing is terrible. And it makes me not like him. But I still root for him. And it's a very weird thing. And part of the reason I think I still root for him is because of the way the other character relationships work in Whiplash. Uh, because we're presented with somebody who's way worse than Neiman. And that is, of course, the character played by J.K. Simmons. Won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor, for good reason, I think. And in the movie, of course, J.K. Simmons is terrible. He's way worse than Neiman. And you kind of understand why Neiman goes to the lengths that he does to make the guy happy. So why I'd say that? Well, I think it is Chazelle's intent to use unlikable characters to tell a really great story. But if somebody came to me and said, I don't like Whiplash because the characters aren't likable, well, they may have a valid point, but I, that's what I'm talking about when the critic or whoever I'm talking to in that scenario should come back to me and say, well, give me more. Give me a persuasive argument about why that character's unlikability makes the movie not work for you. Um, and it may be extremely valid why that may not work for that person. It may trigger an emotional trauma that they had with somebody very similar to the character portrayed by J.K. Simmons. And I think that is a perfectly valid reason to not enjoy the movie Whiplash. Uh, but if you are subjectively trying to say, like, the characters just aren't likable and you leave it at that, that is just boring criticism. It's lame and it doesn't help people. And you might be wondering, why does this matter? Like, who cares? Like, why, John, you're talking about talking about movies? Well, because I do think that in these circles that we're in, when we recommend movies to each other and we try to communicate with each other about movies that we think are worth watching, I think uh, it can affect how movies are made. Filmmakers pay attention to film criticism. They pay attention to how we talk about film in ways that make them want to make film better. Great example of this, and I, I kind of stumbled upon this accidentally. I was reading a thread on Reddit about video essays, uh, which I, I really enjoy video essays about film. There are a lot of really great ones out there. And it got brought up about the uh, the Marvel Symphonic Universe, which is a great uh, video essay by the channel Every Frame of Painting. And uh, I don't believe they still make videos anymore. I think they called it quits, unfortunately. But uh, that was a, that was a great channel. I had really great essays on there. But their persuasive argument was that Marvel's, you know, their symphonic universe, they, they, they don't have, like, scores that were quite as memorable. And I know a lot of people disagree with that video. A lot of people say, well, you know what? Marvel does have you know, a great score. It's just that people don't remember it for whatever reasons and it's nebulous and you can't just, you know, you can't just like throw shade at Marvel for stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have like a clear state stake or whatever stake. Yeah. It's stake in this race or this argument of like, it does Marvel have great movie scores. I like a lot of Marvel scores. Uh, Alvin Silvestri does the, uh, the one for Avengers. And I think it's effective, but that said, you have to look at that video and the effect that it had on the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Ever since that that video came out, and that video caught on like wildfire, it showed up everywhere. 
you may have noticed that in recent Marvel trailers, Marvel movies even, from Doctor Strange, Spider-Man Homecoming, the emphasis and the attention to detail on the score being more integral with the marketing is night and day. Now, this is me theorizing on what Marvel has done. I have no idea if they actually took any of this to heart. But I have to believe, watching this play out in real time, there is a stark difference, no pun intended, that uh, stark, you know. And I, I do think that there's something going on here where they looked at that film criticism. So the, all I'm saying is that if we want Hollywood to make likable characters, I think it's worth talking about in forums about what, why do we think characters are likable and being more persuasive about it. Uh, you know, part of that thread that I just brought up was how some video essays aren't very good at making arguments and we should maybe be a little bit more wary of video essays uh, or people like me talking to you right now who don't bring up examples, who don't explain what they mean, who don't go into more detail. Uh, when I was studying film, when I was writing about film and when I was writing research papers on the history of, you know, the silent film or whatever, I had this amazing writing teacher, uh, one of the greatest film buffs I know, and he would, he would red mark my papers all the time. I wish I learned more from him. But he would say to me, you need to explain what you mean. You need to give examples. And you need to do a good, better job of persuading me. And if you can't do that, then, you know, take a break. Because you may need to rest a little bit. You may not be ready to you know, take on the responsibility of having people look up to you for your movie opinions. If you are somebody who loves to talk about movies at work, for example, I take that kind of stuff seriously. I really want to talk about film in a way with people at work, you know, that is useful to them and that they can know what to check out because they're not all like me. They're not just going to watch everything that comes out. So back to the original thesis. I know I've gone off on like a bunch of wild tangents and that's because I'm not really trying to answer the question here, like what makes a character likable. Um, but I do think that there are some things uh, that we can look out for. And uh, I do want to consult the thread for this because there are was, there was some great uh, opinions on this. Um, so Robbie has said, if I ultimately enjoy seeing them on screen and end up rooting for them, there's that word again, or phrase, uh, they're likable. If character is annoying, they're not funny, terrible dialogue, or God forbid, bland. I start actively rooting against them and am bitterly disappointed if they get a happy ending. So I like what Rabia is saying there, and that's R.A.K. Uh, Rabia's actually been on a podcast that I've done before, a uh, really great person. And uh, what she's basically saying here is that, you know, she's, she's alluding more to how story works in movies. Uh, and if in the story, the point is to have a happy ending, the point is to be happy when a character earns a moment, that's tying back into Jerry, uh, Jeremy's comment here, then uh, in her view, it's a failure. And I totally, I think that's, ex that's extremely valid. Um, Matt Donato said, I think it depends on scenario too. Uh, in many films, certain characters are designed not to be liked, which we've talked about. In these cases, that's a direct response filmmakers want. So this is kind of reviewing what we've talked about. But what I like, I like what he says in his next tweet. I feel equally drawn to characters I despise and characters who are mirror images of myself. Preference, but also the likable thing is indeed a wonky descriptor. So he's kind of opening up a, a Venus flytrap there of relatability. Uh, there was, and, uh, you know, likability, basic. Uh, what somebody and I wish I had the tweet in front of me, but somebody else kind of brought this up like relatability. And uh, I think it was Sam Flynn. I'm sorry if this wasn't Sam Flynn, but uh, Sam Flynn, somebody from Heroic Hollywood, a great writer. Uh, who said uh, he used uh, Walter White from Breaking Bad as a great example because Walter White is a character you can you can kind of relate with, you can identify with, but you don't like Walter White over the course of that show. And to what Matt is saying here, that is ultimately what kind of makes a character likable, even if you despise them. You can do kind of one and the same. And it's such a, again, it's such a nebulous thing. It's so mysterious. And it's not even my main point to try to define what makes a character likable. To me, what makes a character likable is if I can empathize with them. I think it, it, that just speaks to me as a film person. Uh, my priority in storytelling in general, from books to TV to movies, is can I empathize with the story that this writer, director, whoever is trying to say? Can I get a little piece of them in this product? Can I understand them a little bit better? And I give movies uh, in general like bonus points if I can understand a perspective that I didn't understand better before. A good example would be Baby Driver. Uh, Baby Driver is a film where I related with the main character because he has tinnitus. Uh, I also have tinnitus. I cannot hear out of this ear. Uh, I also love to wear sunglasses. And uh, that's just a terrible uh, comparison drawn there. But anyway, he, he lives in the South. I grew up in the South, things like that. 
I related a lot with the character in that movie, with Baby. And uh, in some ways, I identified with him, but I didn't identify with him fully because in that movie, he's a criminal getaway driver. But the universal appeal of that character, and people can disagree with this, but the universal appeal of him is that he is an introvert in an extroverted world. Uh, he is in a world where people are trying to make something like, make sense out of him. They want to understand him. Very dangerous people, for the sake of this being an entertaining movie. Um, and the movie is basically him as an introvert trying to make his way through very difficult circumstances and I identify with that so much and I think that people who watch that movie who may not have that exact same experience can empathize with the baby character and they can kind of understand what it's like to be in that situation uh, even though not everyone's going to directly identify with his circumstances he's a very specific type of person uh, but I love films that do that that communicate personal struggles universally another great example another one of my favorite movies of last year since we're on that train is Coco. Coco is a movie that takes place in New Mexico. Uh, it has Spanglish, you know, mixed in. Uh, one of my favorite movies because it's just really cool to see, you know, you know, as a Puerto Rican, I can see like more Hispanic voices in filmmaking, uh, and you know directed by Leon Critch and you know they obviously like what the voice cast is Hispanic and Latin American and it's just really cool to see and uh, the music too but all that said that is a movie with very universal messages and part of what makes me really like a lot of the characters in that movie even though I don't identify with them even though I can't relate with them is that I get a piece of who they are and I can empathize with them and I can get such a thrill out of who they are as characters. So that's all to say, that's kind of what I find likable about characters. And uh, I just want to raise the conversation. I don't want to say my opinion is fact. That's sort of where I'm at. Uh, and I, I could use more examples, uh, especially in like classic films. I, you know, I was just thinking about the movie Brazil today. I was thinking of some of my like favorite uh, film scores, or if you don't consider Brazil a classic because it's not, you know, old enough. Uh, probably another great example is uh, I would say Foreign Correspondent, the Alfred, the Alfred Hitchcock movie. I do not like the main character in Foreign Correspondent. If you've never seen that movie, that movie is is about a guy uh, during World War II who goes to, to the Britain and uh, he becomes a foreign correspondent for this newspaper. It's like the New York Globe. It's like an offshoot of New York Times or whatever. And he is so unlikable. He's like this really aggressive male character and like the female character in that movie has, wants nothing to do with him at first. But what I love following about his story is the filmmaking behind it. Uh, it's, it's by Alfred Hitchcock, so it's got like really great thil thriller elements. And like I still wa like watching him interact with characters. And he becomes likable over the course of that movie. Those are some of my favorite movies where you start to like the character more and more, but it starts with you disliking the character because of their personality for whatever reason. It was more of a thing back, I think, in the 40s and 50s. Uh, characters would start off as kind of like the Hawkeye from MASH, you know, that it's kind of given that they're a little bit like rough around the edge edges and they wore them up. That's a very common, you know, that's uh, comedic storytelling tends to do this a lot. They start with a character ostracized out of society. And then over the course of a comedy, this is like Greek, ancient Greek stuff. But once they go into society and like the norms and everything, that's when you start to like the character because they appeal more to who you are as a person. And I, I could talk all day about this stuff because I love the way you can break down stories in this way. But all of that to say, uh, if you are somebody who loves to talk about movies, and if you are somebody who considers the value of a movie, the objectivity of good or bad of a movie and its content as something that can be quantified by a character being likable, please do your best to explain what you mean by that. Uh, don't assume that everybody understands what you mean implicitly. And just, yeah, don't take it for granted that people define likable the same way as you. And it will it'll better your film discourse. It'll better the way that if you are a person who writes film or vlogs or whatever you do, if you just talk to people at work about movies because you think that they might like it or you think they might hate it, uh, do a great job of selling your opinion. And I think a great way to do that uh, because characters are so important to the story. They're so important to a movie being good or bad uh, that I do think you should talk about characters. And if you decide that part of what makes the movie enjoyable or not for you is how likable the characters are, just be prepared to make a great case for that to explain exactly what you mean. And uh, with that, uh, that's all I've got for this. I, there were more tweets on that thread. Uh, definitely recommend checking it out. It's uh, some great some great opinions on there I didn't get to, but uh, I appreciate everybody who chimed in on that thread too because I thought it was a really cool conversation. Uh, and I'm not trying to be like aggressive or hostile to anybody who just says like, I think the characters are likable because I 
do it all the time. So I would be aggressive and hostile toward myself. That's nothing new. But uh, yeah, anyway, that's all I got. Uh, if you want to hear more of my opinions on movies and stuff, uh, I'll probably do this again next week if I have the time. And uh, But I'm always on the Cinemaholics podcast. Uh, Cinemaholics on wegotthiscovered.com. And we do new episodes every Sunday and Monday. And uh, again, book's coming out September. Um, it's kind of early to plug it. But uh, if you want to read any of my books, the first book is called Killer Joy. It's uh, one word, Killer Joy. And it's available now, Barnes & Noble and Amazon Prime. You get it shipped right to your house. And we got a new cover. And uh, the cover for Killer Joy is uh, it's so much cooler. It's like, uh, it's amazing. If you check it out, you'll see. All right, that's all I got uh, for real this time. Uh, see you guys another time. Bye.